Hey folks, Dave Politis, k Missing Project, another copyrighted edition for our, our video page. <clears throat> I am at Hungry Horse Reservoir. It's uh, the dam behind us. And the reservoir extends about 20 miles back into the wilderness, into the Bob Marshall. Gorgeous, gorgeous area. There's a road up the east side and the west side of the reservoir. Both are intrinsically gorgeous. And uh, the fishing in the water is not bad, but uh, the flathead flows into it and out of it. And just down here below me, uh, I've taken some videos in the past of the area below the dam, and it's, it's really pretty. This dam was built years and years ago. Runs into a little town down here, and uh, it's a fun little place. Uh, this area up in here is some place I go to just meditate, relax, kind of get into myself and my thoughts. It's peaceful. There's some people coming up here today, but usually there's hardly anyone walking across the dam. The, uh, if you ever get a chance, come up here. It's just out of, outside of Columbia Falls, Montana. Now. Uh, Today I'm going to talk to you about some mailbag and a couple of sightings, or correct that, a couple of uh, disappearances. So the first, the uh, first mailbag I'm going to talk to you about is uh, I'll read it to you. It says intro. I've been binging on your 2019 through 2021 videos in the past month. You are very organized and articulate, and the subject matter is fascinating, though troubling. The films are keeping my mind percolating. I first became acquainted with your work while browsing the topic of Bigfoot evidence of years ago. I would reflect on your words about the missing from time to time over the years. Your news was both alarming and perplexing. Your YouTube channel and recent videos have drawn me in. I just purchased your book, Tribal Bigfoot, as well. Uh, I'm a Canadian from Vancouver. I've been an educator in the private international student sector who has worked abroad and in Canada. I hold a master's in social anthropology. I'm also a writer, sometimes in the professional role. Outside of work, I've been a social and political activist for social justice and peace for most of my adult life. I enjoy moderate day hikes on mountains and elsewhere. Me too. Comments. Response to video posted on March 14, 2021. The segment covers three different disappearances in the Mount Hood National Forest. A, activism. I would say you qualify as an activist. You research a problem, educate people about it, rouse their response, and advocate for more action on it. I know that the activist's life is hard. An activist for truth and genuine justice causes uncomfortable friction, digs up dirt that we don't want to see, and could make people concerned about their image looking dirty necessarily challenges conventions and underlying assumptions and shakes up the power relations. Trying to uncover the hidden and break through the normalization of injustice, secrecy, and apathy can seem lonely and unrewarding. It can seem like no one is listening at times and the work and passion are wasted. Clearly though you have a following and you are accomplishing a lot of education and activation. Courage, you are making a difference. You know, I'm here a lot <clears throat> and I'm talking to a camera, nobody's around, and you wonder sometimes if anyone's listening. And I'm very, very humbly grateful for all the comments that you people have made and all the cards you've given to me. And it does reinforce that what I'm doing is important. Number B, those you are helping. In addition to coming to the aid of the families of the victims and alerting the general public, perhaps you're assisting those of the missing who have passed. It's an interesting thought. Certain respectable specialists would say that the soul that meets her his life's end in a sudden and violent way may be restless or stuck between worlds. It could be that you are helping such souls find their way. <clears throat> what I'm forced to realize too, albeit reluctantly, is that many of the unsolved missing may not have yet passed. Adding all the antidotes, it is reasonable to suggest that there are abductees possibly being held somewhere. Maybe that's why psychics' readings on such cases are so rare. Anyway, it is totally frightening to consider what they might be enduring. Your work might be important, more important than you think. Number two, response to video posted, David Politis answers questions about missing 
and its research. Regarding the mailbag, letter about the dog walker and slip time. Hearing you read this letter brought to mind an issue that I have seldom revealed. Not that I think my experience matches the dog walkers. I don't drive much these days, and one reason is that I have fallen into a trance while commuting in a city a few times. Worrisome. I dislike the monotony of daily commute, and I try to avoid commuting. However, I have had to do, do it sometimes, and in recent years, I let my mind start to ponder something or other while driving a familiar route. I wake up as many as 20 minutes later. The clocks confirm it and my trip has advanced. I have no memory of driving the distance between the last thought and the site I remember, yet my sensory motor system has apparently operated perfectly through the traffic. The last time it happened was at night, though only for a couple of minutes. I snapped to confusedly not recognizing where I was. I found I had driven correctly regardless. So what the heck is going on? I don't think the phenomena is caused externally, but who knows? Now I wonder whether it has happened while commuting by bus, and I think it may have. I have never heard of anyone else experiencing this sort of problem. It only happens to me while driving alone on familiar urban roads. I haven't heard of it either, but maybe, maybe some of you have. Conclusion. Thanks for bearing with a letter that is long like this. My comment on the recent video and the other video posted long ago, I thought this letter would serve best. I really appreciate the work that independent journalists do to report on important topics omitted or underreported or falsely reported to the mainstream. I get half my daily news from such sources. Personally, I can digest your reports because I realize that there's still a lot of science to follow. Also, I'm aware of different types of forms of knowledge and that our society prefers as defined framework and discourse that suits them but obscures information and alternative perspectives. As well, I am sensitive to and accepting of the reality of other dimensions, dimensions in other worlds. That's a good letter. I appreciated that. There's a lot more, as I have said many times, to our world that we don't know. And because of that, I think that it's important that we keep an open mind and we don't try to jump to conclusion on many things. If you think about what the man just said in his letter, and you think about the background that he had as a highly educated person, it takes some analytical thinking and some reflection to really understand what might be happening. Now, we've all heard about lost time where people are driving down the road and three hours later they wake up and they're hundreds of miles away. I don't think that's unusual, per se. I've, I've heard that story hundreds of times through MUFON. But, <clears throat> got another story for you. Story starts. I was 12 and hunting in Missouri. I was hunting in a cornfield in front of me about 300 yards. From the cornfield was a river. Behind me was a small ridge about 50 feet tall, sloping down to me. And then the last 10 feet was a little cliff face, for lack of a better term. The area was all wooded. I was sitting on a stool right at the edge of the field and the wood line. I was facing the field with a tree to my back to lean against. It was late afternoon, almost evening, deer season, and I heard what I thought was a squirrel behind me. If you're not familiar with the sound, it can sound like someone walking. They jump from spot to spot, so if you don't know, it can sound like footsteps. It started to move on top of the ridge and began working its way down to me moving for a few seconds and stopping a few and then moving again. Repeating this until about 50 yards away when I heard something like jumping. When a squirrel moves through leaves, it's a crisp crunch from spot to spot. When a person moves through leaves slowly, it's a slower crunch. The heel hits first and then the rest of the foot. Another way is to walk on the balls of your feet and very slowly bring the back of your foot down. This has a distinct sound as well. I was hearing the former. I waited for it to start again, then I slowly turned around. I heard and saw nothing. It stopped. I thought it had to be a squirrel, so I turned back to the field. It started again, moving closer, so again I turned around. Saw nothing. Reassured myself it must be a squirrel, and again faced the field. It moved closer, and I repeated the aforementioned process. On the fourth time, the sound was right at the little cliff behind me. I was sitting about 15 yards from the cliff so I could see the entire ridge sloping to the edge of the cliff. When I looked this time though, I saw what looked like a human figure lying in the leaves facing me. I was absolutely terrified. 
I raised my, my, my rifle, a 30-30, with open sights to the figure and thought about firing. Probably not a good idea. Then I thought, what am I going to say to everyone back at camp? What am I seeing? All the adults looked up to Correct that. All the adults I looked up to, my little brother, they all think I'm crazy. I can't be seeing this. It was a squirrel. I didn't see that. Just leaves and sticks with the outline of a human. So I lowered my rifle and turned back around. A short amount of time went by, maybe a minute, and then I heard it again. This time I turned quickly. I whirled around and stood up. I raised my rifle to the place where I last heard the sound, and at the edge of the cliff, half behind a tree, there was a human figure. I was so close to pulling the trigger, but I thought it had to be one of my uncles or dad or even a grandpa wearing a sniper suit. That's what I called a ghillie suit at the time. Pulling a prank on me, maybe. They were all in the military. I wanted to shoot so badly, but just couldn't. I told myself at the time I didn't want to be the person who shot someone because of a stupid joke. I'm not so sure now. I just turned back around and reassured myself despite the fact that I just wanted to sprint back to the truck. It was still at least a half an hour before dark. When I got back to camp, I waited for someone to say something about me, you know, sneak it up on me, but nobody did. I waited all weekend, but nobody said anything. It didn't matter, I knew what I saw it wasn't a dressed up person. I just wanted so badly what I saw to be real. Months later, I told my brother because I had to tell someone, but he was only 10, so it just scared him. I don't talk about it often. More know that I'm more now that that I'm almost 40. I don't care what people think as much, but still I don't talk about it unless I'm comfortable around someone. Admittedly, it does feel kind of good to write it out. I forgot to mention that after I turned back around and waited till it was time to head back, I could hear it moving back up the ridge at the same same slow methodical way it came down. I refused to look back, though as long as I could hear it heading away, I didn't look up the ridge again until I got up to the to leave. I didn't see it anymore, or the outlines. I told myself that the leaves and background must have been making the noise. Well, I think this person wrote this letter because he was disturbed by it, about it. And now, 38 years later, he's still talking about it. So, I've heard about this sort of thing now probably, oh, couple dozen times and I really never heard it about it before we came out with Missing 411 The Hunted. Again, you can watch The Hunted for free and our first movie Missing 411 for free. It's under the, the description of this video or it's on the pinned comment for this video. The pinned comment is the first comment on the video. Also, uh, our Missing Person website is there. I, uh, when we did The Hunted, I know what happened. I, or I shouldn't say. I, I know that the Maccabees saw what they did. There was too much surrounding evidence to support what they saw. I do think that something unusual is happening. Now, because the Maccabee incident was seen uh, in conjunction with some kind of UFO nearby, it's hard not to think that they're somehow connected. And I'm not an idiot, and I'm not saying they are. I'm just saying there's a connection there, time and place. So thank you very much for your comments. I appreciate them. I try to read everyone. Now today, we're going to talk about two cases. Some of the subsets I write about in the books involve mushroom pickers, sheep herders, berry pickers. And these involve two berry pickers. And we're talking about each end of the age spectrum. First one it happened to a small boy named Jack Pike, five years old, September 5th, 1935, St. Norbert, Manitoba, about 11 miles south of Winnipeg, and not that far from the Minnesota border. So it was 55 here yesterday, and it's snowing here right now. Yeah, it's a little cold. So, anyhow, Jack went with his mom and dad to a place called the Trappist Monks Monastery in St. Norbert. Now, why is that important? Because a lot of you have made statements that 
they believe religion somehow plays into this. And I think it might. Somehow, I don't understand how. But, so, in this, might be hard to see, but uh, this is the Trappist Monk Retreat. Winnipeg's up here, and this is the Red River. So if you're looking, if you want to Google it, the LaSalle River's here, Red River's here, St. Norbert's Monastery's here, and even today, it's all wooded in that area. So they were picking blueberries, and a husband and wife knew Jack was nearby, and they heard him scream, and then the scream immediately got muffled. And the mom and dad ran right to the area where they heard the screams, and they looked around and there was nothing there. They decided to run and surround that area where he disappeared and they searched for two hours, didn't find him. Now you've got to understand something, that they hear a scream that quickly and they realize that something is happening. And the parents understand that their son is not going to run that far or that fast. And when mom and dad come into an area, they're going to look, obviously, for the boy, and the boy's going to respond to that mom and dad. Now, they decided to call the RCMP. They came into the area, and a giant search started. Giant. And it was the biggest search in the history of Manitoba at the time. And the, one report said there were 2,000 searchers. Another said there were 3,000. Needless to say, there were thousands. And they searched for days. And as they started to gear it down at the end of the fourth day, a man was about 150 yards from the river. And he came across Jack under a bush about two miles from the point where he initially disappeared. Now that is not unusual. Most kids are found within that two mile radius. This area had been searched dozens of times. Many people said that they came within feet of this bush. Well, when they found Jack, he was face down, unconscious. He was picked up. He was described as having a serious bruising about the legs, scratches all over his body. And he was taken to a local hospital where they gave him stimulants and they gave him a blood transfusion. They said that he just gained consciousness for a short period of time, raised his arm, never made a sound. And many articles in the paper called the incident mystifying, uh, suspicious. Some people thought he was abducted. Uh, there was no evidence of him being harmed by a human, and there was no evidence of abduction in their minds after he was found. But then again, there was no evidence about how he could have avoided people for four days. It was 96 hours. Now understand something that uh, you have two rivers in that area. They were berry picking. They had a scream that was cut off. The doctor said that he died of hypothermia. There was rain during the search that people said hindered the search effort. The doctors also said he suffered from dehydration, exposure, starvation. Folks, they were there picking berries, number one. Water everywhere, number two. He was in an area where there were thousands of people, number three, including his parents. They were calling his name, they were looking for him, they weren't finding anything. And the biggest, probably, mystery behind this is that why didn't he answer if he was in that area? And number two, if he was in the area, then why hadn't the 3,000 searchers found him? Never really was answered sufficiently. And when you understand the multitude of cases that I've talked about like this, it starts to make some sense. These happen routinely. They happen many times in my books, previously searched. So, now, this is, this is what Jack looked like. And, uh, young boy, very sad story, very sad. And uh, when I was doing the research behind it, didn't quite, uh, didn't quite believe it at the beginning, but I saw so many articles that described this 
from a multitude of sources, it was what it is. Uh, he survived nine hours after being found. Now, the people that are found, that I write about, many times they are found unconscious. And if they are found, they can't explain what happened to them. And in this case, unfortunately, Jack never said a word. So, it's case number one. Case number two involved a lady named Rose Jewett, 95 years old. And this happened about 10 miles north of Elk River, Idaho, in a very, very rural wilderness type area. It's almost where the road ends before you go into the wilderness. What they were doing is they were huckleberry picking. Huckleberries, for some reason, are the most dangerous berry to pick where people are not found. I can't explain it, but she was with her daughter and her daughter's husband. And it was about 5 p.m. that Rose was last seen. And she was seen by her sister, by her uh, daughter and the husband sleeping. Now, every report said that she had a recent heart attack and she had a recent stroke and she was very immobile. And that's the reason that she was in camp. Now, if you understand that, you understand that, first of all, a 95 year old person is not going to wander far. And she lived in a little town called Julieta, about 20 miles southwest from where they were. It was a good huckleberry picking area, very primitive. There was, the family stated they only saw one other car in the entire area during the entire day. It was a California car. There were, it was a four day search. 250 men, aircraft, horses, bloodhounds, everything you can imagine inundated this area. The sheriff poured everything he could into it. One of the canines walked in a circle around the parking area and stopped near the road where their car was at. Now some people interpreted that that maybe she got into a car, but when you look at the scene and you understand how it walked around, probably walked around the parking lot because Rose had walked around during the time she had there she was there and gone back to her car. They were looking and scratching to get a logical answer for this and they weren't doing it. And they at the end and weeks later they played up this avenue of the car. But the reality of it is there was no evidence that there was an abduction, there was no evidence she was taken. The family posted a $500 reward for anyone to find her. Now let's think about this case. So it happened in a cluster zone of missing people. As you know, I've made videos about Idaho before. Some of the strangest cases I've ever done came out of that area. Water, there were several creeks in this area. They were berry picking. Canines couldn't find her. She was never found. And lastly, I want you to think about both these cases involve the opposite end of the spectrum. Now in Jack's case, to me, something either grabbed him or he fell into something. I've had people write to me and say, well Dave, maybe Jack walked into a portal and his screen was cut off by the portal and you couldn't see him when you walked into that area. Well, if you remember the Mesa Verde case of Dale Staling, there was a reporter that walked into an area and heard somebody calling for help, walked all through the area and could never find the person. That happened twice, search and rescue and to the reporter. And people said in that incident, well, maybe he walked into some portal where he could see out, but nobody could see him. Could that have happened to Jack? Yeah, maybe. Could something have grabbed Jack and put their hand over his mouth? Possibly. But he wasn't, he wasn't hurt by anyone. He wasn't molested. And then Rose Jewett, 95 years old. I, I've always thought about this case and thought, I can't see anyone taking her because she's so old and feeble and needy that it'd be a lot more work to take her than it would be to leave her. Um, yeah, confusing cases. Uh, those are two of just, a, it's just a small handful of dozens of cases on uh, Rose on uh, 
berry pickers, mushroom pickers, sheep herders, people that have been in the wilderness. Well, it looks like the sun's starting to come out a little bit. Part of the reservoir is frozen over, but then part of it isn't. Uh, they've got bull trout in there, they've got rainbows, they've got a lot of big fish in that, that reservoir. Hard to catch sometimes, but uh, I've had friends tell me that they've caught them before. And uh, lots of grizzly bear in this area. Right now there's uh, one wall of this mountain has snow. This one over here. And then the uh, other one doesn't. So, kind of a unique spot right now. <laughs> Look how weird it is. You know, 10 minutes ago it was snowing, now it's sunny. But uh, that's Montana. Uh, thank you very much. I, I cannot tell you how humbled I am by the cards, letters, and things that have been sent to me. People have sent me fishing flies. They've sent me uh, sweaters. They've sent me blankets. My gosh, I'm, I'm so humbled by all of the kind and generous things people have sent in regards to Ben. You know, I've, I've told people that I hope I'm getting better, and I, I think I am, but emotions about him come at me in waves. I can't quite explain it. it. It's almost like you're driving down a road and a big gust of air hits you of depression. And it, certain things will remind me of them and it just destroys me for a period of time. But I, I've told a lot of people all of all the generosity of you people. And uh, I think our channel is a good place and it's an example for other YouTube channels that if you send the right message, the right kind of people are going to come and they're going to watch. And I think that's what's happening with us. We have the right people. We have good people that care about each other. And I know I care about you. And I know you care about me. And the number of people out there that are going through depression, I've heard, I've heard from you. And I hear you. And it troubles me that we have this much going on in our world. Many of you have said that you get a lot of satisfaction out of seeing the videos with the wilderness, and thank you. I'll, I'll try to keep doing that as the weather's good. So, thank you for being on my channel. Thank you for, for being my friend. Give a thumbs up to this video, please, and please put it on social media so other people can watch. I'll give you a little scan of this area before I go. So what you're looking at right there, that would be the west side of the mountain. And there's the eastern side of the lake where there's really no snow. But during the summer months, there's uh, camping on both sides of the lake, lots of people on the water. People, you can drive over this reservoir, over the wall, to get to the other side. But anyhow, Thanks again for watching, and we'll be back soon. Have a great week. Bye.